Okay, so um, today we are going to uh, review the lecture one, lecture four. It's a very short and uh, brief review, but includes all the important concepts that we need for midterm one. So just a reminder that uh, midterm one will be on next Tuesday. Okay, so make sure you arrive on time. So we will go over this very brief review and then we can talk about homework four, uh, the convolution part. After that, if you have any uh, further questions, we can discuss them in the office hour. So in lecture one, we start with uh, some props, basic properties about signals. Uh, we introduce the signal energy so this is how we calculate the signal energy. We take the magnitude of the signal, xt, raise it to the power of two, and then integrate over the entire time domain. Okay, so here the magnitude is, uh, is the magnitude of a, the complex signal xp. Now here's an example, calculate the energy of this causal signal xt so we can we can quickly do this so the ex is now so in the exam so always write down the original definition first in case uh, you forgot it And then we substitute xt into this uh, formula. So the now, in this case, it is a real signal. So the magnitude is basically the, uh, this is a real number. So we just, we just need to square it. So we have e to the power of negative t and ut to the power of, power of two is itself because ut is a unit step uh, signal. Right, the amplitude of ut is just one. So ut to the power of two is just the ut. Okay, and then we have this integration, just to work it out. We have this ut here. So we know this ut will, can be absorbed into the integration to restrict the range uh, to zero to positive infinity. Okay, so whenever you see a UT or product of multiple UTs, they are always uh, understood as window function, kind of a window function. Okay, so this UT will restrict the integration uh, within the positive time domain. And then you just work out the, this integration. So this is the signal energy part. Uh, for the signal power, we need to follow this definition to work out the signal power. Basically, uh, evaluate the, integrate the energy over a, a finite time domain from negative t to t, and then average over the, uh, the, this finite time domain. And then finally push the limit capital T to the infinity. So it's basically an average signal energy over the time domain. And in particular, if the signal is a periodic signal, we can, we can calculate the power uh, by using this simplified, simplified formula. Well, this A is any, any arbitrary constant. So we, we just need to evaluate this integration over one period of the signal from A to A plus capital T. Now, for example, if we want to calculate the signal power for cosine T, and we can leverage this periodic formula.
So Px is 1 over t integration a, a plus t. Right, but for cosine t, we know that t is 2 pi. And then we can choose a equal to zero to simplify that. Because a is arbitrary, we can just focus on zero to two pi. So this becomes one over two pi, zero to two pi. And this is cosine square t dt. And then we know the cosine square t is one, one plus cosine two t over two dt. And then you just work out this integration one by one. There are two components. Okay, so this is signal energy and signal power. So remember, in general, this uh, this is the magnitude of this complex signal. So if x is given in a complex form, you need to find out the magnitude. And then we we say a signal is continu uh, a continuous time signal is periodic with period t if it satisfies this periodic condition. Um, and in particular, for this signs, uh, for this cosine signals, cosine omega t plus theta, the period is basically two pi divided by omega, because the signal can be understood as, you know, starting from cosine t and uh, do a time, uh, time scaling with factor omega. So the period two pi is scaled by by the factor omega. And then we introduced many uh, special uh, continuous time signals, and especially for the impulse signal delta t, uh, it's, it has many fundamental properties. So one of the properties is this um, sampling property. So if we want to look at uh, arbitrary signal f at a specific time t, t naught, then this can be represented using um, using the uh, this integration between the signal ft and the a shifted version of the impulse signal in this way. So the idea is that ft any signal ft multiplied by the shifted impulse. Now we can replace the first one by a constant, which is the signal evaluated at uh, this time shift T naught. Okay, so this is the fundamental uh, property of the impulse signal. <clears throat> And then utilizing this property, we can we can do this type of integrations uh, very quickly. So basically, we can regard the this part as f t. So this is f t times delta t minus one. So we can replace the previous part by you know f evaluated at one. So here the time shift is one. And then that gives us the value e to the power of negative one. If we replace t by one uh, here. Okay, so this is the sampling property of the impulse, impulse function. The second part is about systems. Uh, we, we talk about uh, First of all, we talk about many properties of, of systems. Uh, the first property is the ca causality of systems, meaning that if we look at looking at the system equation, uh, if the output only depends on the past or the present inputs, 
then we say that this system is, is a causal system. And in particular for a, a LTI system, we know that such a system is causal if the impulse response is a causal signal. So for LTI systems, we can just look at the impulse response uh, to identify, to categorize the causality. Now here's an example, this is a integration system. Well, yt is the integration of x tau, well tau starts from zero to t plus three. And we can see, we can see that the present time is t, the present output is yt, so the present time is t. But apparently this present output relies on so here the integration, the range over the, this tau is up to t plus three. Apparently uh, it, it depends on x at t plus three, uh, which is the future compared to the present time index t. So in this case, uh, the, we can say that the present output relies on the future of the input. So the system is not, is not causal. And then the second uh, property of system uh, is the stability. Now we say a system is, is stable if the input if the input is bounded, then the output is also bounded. Okay, so we have this bounded input, bounded output property. If if it satisfies this property, then we say the system is stable. And in, in particular. For linear and time invariant systems, stability can be a sufficient condition for stability can be uh, the absolute integratability of the impulse response. So if the impulse response is abs absolutely integratable, then the LTI system is stable. Okay. So here we have, an, we have this absolute value of this magnitude not absolute value, but this is a magnitude because the impulse response can be, generally can be a complex signal. So let's consider this example, is the LTS system with such a impulse response stable? So we just need to check this abs absolute uh, integrated, integratable condition. So evaluate, Now plug in this HT into this condition. So it's basically, is this one. So it's the magnitude of the entire uh, impulse, impulse signal. And in this case, this is a this is a real real signal, and we know that both of these two are non-negative. But this is a unit step signal; it is non-negative. The, the the amplitude, and this is an exponential signal. So this value is also non-negative. So we can just get rid of this uh, magnitude sign. And at the same time, we can absorb this. Uh, unit step signal into this integration. So, so the tau by absorbing this unit step signal, the tau is restricted to zero to infinity. So this becomes, the integration becomes this one. And this is an integration uh, over uh, exponentially decreasing signal in the post only the positive domain so you can you can do you can check that this is a finite you get a finite value so basically this uh this absolute integrate integratability condition is satisfied so the system is stable this lti system is stable
And then the next two are the most important properties about uh, systems, which are the time invariance and linearity properties. And we have worked, uh, we have worked, worked on many examples in the, in the lectures. So here are two examples. Uh, here are two systems and determine whether they are time invariant or not. So for the second one, it is a linear system. It is easy, actually easy to verify because the, from the system equation, uh, it is just a linear scaling of the input. So the input xt is multiplied by a constant signal, uh, cosine e to the power of t. And this, is a, this can be treated as a constant signal because it does not rely on the input. So the, in, this, in this sense, the input output relation is kind of linear. So you can follow the, the standard three steps uh, that we mentioned in the slides and check that this, this system is indeed a linear system. So now look at this, look at the first example. Um, so let's follow the standard three steps to check the uh, time invariance of this system. I think we have a similar example in the, in the slides. So step one is always generate a shifted shifted version of the input. And then we are going to feed this x tilde t to the system. So the corresponding output y tilde t uh, according to the system equation is the signal sine t multiplied by the input, uh, which is now x tilde t. And now since we define x tilde t as the shifted input, so this can be further written as x t minus tau. So this is the y tilde t in terms of input. And step three, we, we look at uh, y t minus tau directly. And then we need to compare y t minus tau uh, with y to the t. So from the system equation, we know that y t minus tau is sine. So I'm going to replace t by t minus tau. So it's sine t minus tau x t minus tau. And you can see that these two are not, these two are not equal equivalent. Okay. So the sign part are different. So this means that if we directly shift the original output, then this is going to be different from first shifting the input and then feed it into the system, so which means that the system is not invariant to the time shift. So this is not, not time invariant. Okay, so this is about uh, the system properties. And then we go to the LTS systems. Uh, for LTS systems, we introduced uh, the impulse response, which is the response of the system when the input signal is the impulse signal. So HT is the impulse response. And then we show that the input and output relation of LTS systems can be characterized in terms of the convolution operation. So the output signal YT is basically the convolution between the input and the impulse response of the system. And specifically the convolution is defined in, in, uh, in such a way. So it's an integration between X and a reversed and shifted H.
So in the uh, in the in the slides in the lecture we have gone through this example to calculate the convolution. Um, I won't repeat it here because I think I make I made a mistake there. So so let's let's look at these two signal. We have uh, x t. And ht is e to the power of negative 2t dt. So this one decays faster. Okay, and then we just plug them into the convolution formula. So x convolution with ht is the integration. Now x tau is e negative tau u tau. And then we have this h t minus tau. Now h t minus tau is e negative two t minus tau u t minus tau. So this is the convolution formula. And again, the integration is over tau, so we can pull out this constant coefficient. And then simplify, we have e tau u tau u t minus tau. Right, so it's, uh, yeah, this is two tau minus tau, so we get e to the power of tau. Okay, I think the mistake I made is uh, here, is here. So the, this window function is a little bit uh, tricky, it depends on the, the range of the T. So let's, let's look at this very carefully. Uh, so we have U tau times U T minus tau. Well, tau is the time variable and T is just a fixed, fixed constant. So we can, So u tau is clear, it's a standard unistep signal. So it is like this one. This is tau, so this is u tau. So this one is clear. But for u t minus tau, um, it really depends on the, the sign of this t. So think about how do we get U T minus tau from U tau. You do a time reversal to get U negative tau. And then right, you further do a time shifting, shift it to the right by T units. So that's that's how you get U negative tau plus T, right, which is U T minus tau. However, this, when you say shift to the right by T units, this T can be either positive or negative. But if, if the T you are looking at is uh, positive, then we are shifting, we are shifting the reversed uh, unit step function to the right by some units. But if T is negative, then we are basically shifting this one to the left because of the sign. So this is this is u negative tau. Okay, this is also clear. And then there are two cases. If t so basically, if t is positive, then we, then uh, u t minus tau looks like this we are shifting this reversed signal to the right by t units and now t is positive so we are shifting to the right and in this case u tau 
and U T minus tau, they have an overlapping area. So, so their product is a, gives a window function, which is between zero and T. So this is what we have in, in the class. However, uh, if T, if we are looking at the negative T, then uh, we are essentially shifting this one to the, to the left. Because now T is negative, by right? shifting to the right by T units, but T is negative, which means you are shifting to the left by negative T units. So the picture looks like this. And then in this case, uh, this signal has no overlapping, overlap with the U tau signal. So when you take their product, when you take their product, they simply give a zero signal everywhere. So basically, in the end, in the end, we can we should conclude that u tau times u t minus tau. It depends on the sign of the t. If t is non-negative, then this is a. Uh, uh, Then this is a standard window function between zero and t, okay, amplitude one. Uh, if t is negative, then then it is zero. I don't know your picture. Then it's zero. Therefore, when you uh, plug in this one, so we can we can continue. So this now, so since if t is negative, then this product is simply zero. So we don't have to discuss the case when t is negative. If t is negative, this is zero. Everything is zero, right? The entire thing is zero. So we just need to discuss the case uh, when T is positive. Now, when T is greater than or equal to zero, uh, this product is a window function between zero and T. And then, because it's a window function, so we can, we can use it. It is equivalent to restricting the integration between zero and T. Right, because it's a window function. So we just copy everything here. So it's E negative two T integration zero to T. Now it's a window function. And then we can have, we have this E to the power of tau, uh, D tau. So we get rid of that, that uh, this window function. And then we just evaluate uh, this integration, uh, which is, This one. Okay, so this is what we obtained in the in the slides in the last lecture. But uh, turns out this only works for T being positive, being non-negative. And the other case is that you no know, zero. When T is negative, by right, this product is simply zero. So we only get zero output so to summarize to summarize y t again these two can be this is a uh, segmented function but the, the change point is, is at zero so we can we can use ut to we can simply write write it in this way, multiply by ut, it already covers both cases, right? When t is greater than zero, ut is simply one. So we have this one. When t is less than zero, ut is zero. So we have the zero part. So in the end, yt should be uh, written in this way. So we don't have, we have an additional ut here. So basically the response, if you look at the, the output, 
uh, here inside this signal spans over the entire time domain, but after multiplying by ut, you know, the, the yt is a causal signal. So in the end, the output is a causal signal. And this makes sense because if you look at the input, both the input and the impulse response of the system are causal. But the input is causal signal, the system is causal system. The output has to be a causal output. Right. So this is the missing part uh, in the last lecture. There should be a UT outside. Okay. And this is because, because of this uh, product. So when you discuss this product of the unistep functions, uh, <clears throat> remember that it is actually depends on the value, depends on the sign of the index T. So you have two different cases. What will be an example of when T is negative? Because the CT negative here is minus 2T, but. Sorry, can you re repeat that again? I didn't get that at the beginning. Um, yeah, I'm confused when T would be negative. Like I see we have E to the negative 2T, but we still use the. No, the, the I think the starting point is that we are looking at, you know, this is YT, right? We are looking at yt, which is which is the convolution between x and h, right? Mm -hmm. But here we are, we don't we don't have any constraint of on t. So we are looking at we want to derive a formula for yt for any t. Right? This is this is what we want. We want the entire output. So when we start this uh, convolution formula, this t, the range of this t is from no from negative infinity to positive infinity. So it could be negative, either negative or positive. But when we start to evaluate this convolution, we realize that it, it involves this product of unit step functions. Mm -hmm. And then we, through, through this discussion, we found that such a product of unit step functions has two cases, depending on the sign of your input T. If, you're, if you are looking at output yt at a positive time t, then it turns out that this, this product uh, gives a window function. And on the other hand, if we are looking at yt at a negative time index t, turns out that uh, this is simply zero. So that, that's why we need to, at this, at this point, we need to discuss this case by case. If, if the t that we are looking at is positive, this, this becomes a window function and then we can work out the integration. Otherwise, if the, t that, if the t that we are looking at is negative, then it is simply zero. So we don't, have, we don't need to do any calculation. Is this logic clear to you? Yeah, I think so. If so, like the example would be if, if we were given u of, um, let's see, t, um minus three i think um so then we would replace t with t minus tau and then it would become minus minus right and so then we have t plus a number therefore shifting it to the left instead of the right yeah for them yeah it's, if t is negative three uh, so here it, it becomes u negative three minus tau and that picture may look like this. Here, here t is negative three. So the so u t minus tau is now you know, shifted to the left. So the picture is actually on the left. The signal is on the left, not on the right. So there's no overlap between u tau and this u t minus tau. So that's why their product is simply zero. Simply zero. Uh, if t is positive, then the picture is on the right, signal is on the right, at least part of the signal is on the right part. And then they have these two has non uh, zero overlap. So in that case, their product gives a window function, a window signal. Okay. 
Yeah. So in the in the last lecture, we only I only mentioned the first case. I forgot the, the second case. And this is critical because in the end, this will uh, introduce and this ut in the final expression, which makes the final output a causal signal. Right after introducing this ut, um, the signal is causal. It only has a has non-zero signals in the positive time domain. So. <clears throat> Okay, I, I guess when we yeah when we go to homework four we will have have to deal with more more issues like this. But you kind of get the idea whenever you see the product of these two uh, unit step functions. I actually suggest you kind of go through this uh, process to quickly verify to quickly work out the. The equivalent mathematical expression for this product of uh, unit step functions. Yeah. We, we can go over more examples uh, when we look at homework two. So this is the convolution part. Okay. So in the in the exam, if I give you two arbitrary signals xt and ht, you should be able to work out their convolution. So uh, the other property about convolution is the delay property. So if the if we know that x and h their convolution gives y, then if both a, x and h are delayed or are shifted by some uh, time shift tau one and tau two, then their corresponding convolution is essentially uh, taking the original convolution signal delayed by tau one plus tau two. So the delay from the inputs are uh, added up in the in, on the output side. So this is a delay property uh, for the convolution. So using this property, when, whenever you need to calculate the convolution between delay signals, you, know, you can always first work out the convolution using the undelayed versions and then simply shift the output yt uh, properly. <clears throat> and for discrete LTI systems, we have we have exactly the all the parallel uh, definitions and equations. So we also have this impulse response of discrete time LTI system. But now the impulse signal is defined in a discrete time case delta n has a, a very simple analytical form so delta n is simply a standard a discrete arrow located at the original point and then the, the amplitude of this point is just one. So in this case, it, is, it has a, an analytical expression. <clears throat> and again, the, for the discrete LTS system, the input and output is uh, related through this discrete convolution. It's basically the same as the continuous version but here we are looking at summation instead of summation over discrete time indexes instead of the integration. Okay, now let's look at one example here about a discrete LTI system. So this is a discrete LTI system. Um, so the output depends on the present input and the past input. So it is also a causal system. The first uh, part A is to find the impulse response HN.
So how, how do we find the impulse response for this LTS system, this great time system? And the system equation is given here. Now, what is the impulse response? Right, the impulse response is a signal, right? It's the response to the to an impulse input. So how do we find that? Any idea? Yeah, so you just feed, uh, feed the input uh, to an impulse, feed the impulse to an input, right? So just let Xn be the impulse and then look at the Yn, look at the Yn. So from the system equation, when the xn is this impulse, yn is, uh, you know, uh, xn is the delta n. So it's delta n plus three minus delta n minus two. So this is the response to the uh, impulse we input. So this is basically the the impulse response HN. Okay. Right. This is just by definition. Impulse response is the corresponding output when you input a impulse signal. So this HN is given in this form. And whenever you see in the discrete time case, whenever you see something, some signal like this, you can always write it uh, into a short sequence. Because in this case, right, delta n, delta n is just a one. I mean, okay. For example, we can first visualize uh, this h n in in the figure. So we have a delta n here. Now delta n is basically the the impulse at the original point, and in this case, the discrete impulse at amplitude one. So it is a this discrete arrow. Now three times delta n minus one. So delta n minus one is delta n shifted to the right by one units. So we have it is located here, and also the amplitude is scaled by three. So we have a higher. Um, lower. Okay, so this is three. And similarly, uh, minus delta n minus two. So the third arrow is located at, so we are shifting delta n to the right by two units. So it is here, but the amplitude is negative one, right? We have a negative one coefficient. So it's right here, negative one. But you don't have to draw this picture. You just need to, you can just write it into a sequence. One, three, and negative one. So this is exactly the, the discrete signal uh, that we have for HN. So if you, but in this case, delta N is just uh, one. And then we always put an arrow here to remind us that this is the original uh, time index. So basically this is H0, this is H1, this is H2. So we usually, uh, in the exam or in the homework, you can just write using this notation. So you write out the corresponding discrete sequence and then you put an arrow under uh, the, the entry well, uh, which corresponds to the time zero. So in this case, uh, so you can find time zero by looking for this delta n, right? This is the starting point. Uh, this is the original 
this is the signal hn evaluated at the original point. So with this arrow, we know that this is this entry corresponds to uh, time zero. Yeah, with this arrow, we uh, we know that this entry has, corresponds to the time index zero. Otherwise, it is not clear uh, where the signal starts. So as another example, I, I, let's give you another example. Suppose well, we have Hn is which is delta n plus one plus delta n minus two, right? So, and then you can quickly, you can quickly translate this into a discrete sequence. As the, the first entry, is located at the time index negative one because it is delta n shifted to the left by one unit. So this is corresponds to the uh, time index negative one. So the corresponding value is just one. Okay, because, because it is one times this impulse. And then uh, between these two, we are missing many, we are missing many intermediate time indexes. So we which means that the signal takes zero value at time zero at time one so we have two zeros here and after that at time two we have another impulse so which gives another one okay. so this is the discrete sequence representation of this h signal and in this case we know that the zero, the zero index is located here right because the first first impulse is located at time negative one. So this is this is corresponding to time negative one. So here, the second one corresponds to time zero. And then this is one, this is two. So this is the, sequence representation of a discrete time signal. Okay, now this is part A, part B. Suppose we input such a discrete time signal. Well, the non-zero value one is at n, find y n. Okay, let's look at this. So from part A, we know that the impulse uh, signal is given by one, three, negative one, right? It's from here. And we have an arrow here to indicate that, to indicate that this is the, this corresponds to the time, original time point. And now we are given this input xn, uh, which is one, three, two, negative one. Well, the non-zero value one is at n. So we put an arrow here to indicate that uh, this is the study, this is the original time point. So now both the input and the impulse response are specifically given. We need to find the corresponding output. And because this system's LTR, we know that this is given by the convolution. And in this case, uh, since the input and the and the impulse signal are given in a in a sequential sequential form, so we just need to we need to use that matrix multiply method that we introduced in the, in the class to calculate the convolution. Okay. If they are given in a very concrete numerical you know, sequ sequence form, we can refer to the matrix multiply method. Okay, following this, this is like uh, copied from the last lecture. Now let's follow this one. 
to construct these uh, matrices. So you can choose one of them to, to be fixed. Now, usually we choose the shorter one to, to, to be fixed. So here, HN only has three entries. So I'm going to fix HN, uh, which is one, three, F1. Right, so it's in the column column vector form. And then I'm going to generate the big matrix by shifting uh, the X and column wise. So for the first column, I start with the signal XN. I list it uh, into a column. And then since, so looking at the, the signal HN, it has three entries. So I need to generate three columns uh, in this big matrix. So the way we generate these columns is to shift your first column downwards one by one. So in so basic so therefore in the second column it is basically shifting it's one three two negative one. So this is we shift it downwards. So one three two negative one. So we have this one, and then we shift it again for the third column one three two one and then remember to fill up all the other entries by zero okay. so this is a shifting the first column downwards by uh, by three times and then you do the matrix multiplication uh, to get the convolution on uh, yn so this will be, so this is the YN. And in particular, the first entry is Y0. So I'm gonna put an arrow there to indicate that uh, the first entry corresponds to time index uh, zero. So in the end, your result could be, you can write, you can just report, okay, YN is this sequence, you can write it in the row, so YN, it's just a, a sequence. Uh, I'm using an arrow to indicate the time index of the original point. Right, so you just uh, write H and X into a sequence form and then just do a matrix multiply method. So I think this uh, covers everything that we need uh, for the mission one. So if you need more practice, you know, I, I don't have additional problems, but you can just redo the, all the homework problems without, uh, without referring to uh, the solution set and only utilizing your reference sheet. Try to do it independently and then verify the verify the result. That should be quite enough for the for preparing the mission one. And for the rest of the time, we can look at almost four. Okay, I'm gonna comment on, maybe we have a comment. Uh, 
I don't think so. I think everyone just uh, we're working on the exam uh, simultaneously in person and over the Zoom. Oh, you mean for the exam problems? Okay, I don't. I don't think we have that. That is just for homework. Yeah. We have questions. Yeah. The question is how hard would the integration calculus be involved in the exam? I think they will be in the same level as uh, homework. And as well, so you can just look at this uh, review slides. All these integrations, uh, they are about the same level. We don't have those very complicated integrations. And uh, if needed, I will provide you the uh, integration formula if, if the function is a little bit complex. So once you find the right logic, you can directly, you should be able to you know, directly apply that formula and get the, get the integration results. Yeah. So I think there's no challenge on the integration on the calculus part. Okay. I think we might have something uh, related to the even all functions, but yeah, but I, it's not clear how I can clarify this to you. But I think if you if all you need to have is to you know, remember the definition of even all functions. Yeah, there's no, there's nothing complicated. Uh, there you don't have to deal with the integrations deal and deal with any integrations there <clears throat> so it's, it will be just uh, on a definition level invertibility uh, of systems uh, i don't think so i don't think we have that yeah we i, I don't think we have anything re related to invertibility in the homework so that's just for uh, reference in this in the lecture slides. Any question on the last slide? Okay. Um, so if either the input signal or the response have a time value of eight months, so say if they said it went from zero to three, it went from negative one to example, will we still say that alpha starts at y zero no matter what? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. We was, yeah, we, we have that uh, kind of issue in the problem four. So it will be different. And how do we so how do we address that? Um, there are there are two ways, but I I suggest you follow uh, follow this way. So let's say, so let's say the so we can work on a concrete example. Uh, let's just refer to this one where the for example, okay, I'm going to generate one, two, three, and uh, one, two, three, four, and I'm going to put arrows you know, here and here. Which means that okay, we can do that. Yeah, we can do that. So, which means that now the first entry here is h, right? This is zero. This is time zero. This is h zero. So, this is h negative one, h negative two.
And uh, here, similarly, this is x0, x negative 1, x1, x2. Okay. So now we are not here, we are always starting from 0, x starting from x0, starting from h0. Uh, but here we are starting from something else. So okay, we can use the uh, delay property of convolution to deal with this. So you can always shift these signals uh, to, into this case. Once you work out convolution, you just need to shift back uh, by utilizing, let me go back to the, yeah, to the, <coughs> to the delay properties. Okay. So basically whatever you, However, you shift the signals uh, from the input side, the output is the, on the output side, right? All those shifts will be added up together. So you just remember, so here's a, we can, we can just do it like this. I first consider, okay. Instead of h and I consider this x tilde n, well, I shift the signal to to the right by two units. So let me just remember, uh, remind myself. This is uh, shift to the right by two units. But if I shift, it, if I shift this signal to the right by two units, this H negative two now becomes H zero. Uh, right. So now it's a standard, it, it falls into uh, this standard form. The arrow is under the first entry. And then I'm doing the same thing for the second one. Well, I just need to, you know, from X to X tilde, I'm going to shift it to the right by one unit. Okay. And then you, you get, a, and then you calculate the convolution uh, between these two using the matrix multiply method. The same uh, procedure as we've done before. And you get, let's say you get something here. Uh, right. And then because these two signals, they, uh, we start from the, the first entry, so the original point is on the first entry. So after convolution, this y tilde, uh, we should have the arrow right here. The first entry is y0, so the arrow should be placed under the first entry. Okay. Now this is the y tilde n, which is the convolution between these two time-shifted inputs. So now you need to go back because we know that hn, right, from these two, operations, we are shifting the inputs to the right by two and one units respectively. So which means YN compared to the, the compared to the original outputs, YN should be so Y to the N should be generated from YN by shifting to the right by three units. Well, these two no, these two time shifts are added up by the convolution, delay property of convolution, which means once you have this YN, you need to shift, shift it to the left by three units to get YN. Once you have this Y to the N. Therefore, YN is you no know, by shifting, shifting the signal to the left. So basically, YN is you no know, something. The arrows is shifted to the right by three units. Great. Yeah, so <clears throat> by leveraging the time delay property of convolution, right, you, you can always first reduce to the standard case and then shift the arrow properly.
Yes, so from the convolution property, right, the time shifts are added up uh, right here, right here. If we shift both, the, both of the inputs and then take convolution, then it is almost like we first take convolution and then shift the output correspondingly. But then on the output side, the time shift is the summation of the time shifts from both of the input side. So in this case, we are shifting the input to the right by two and to the right by one respectively. So that that we, that, that means uh, from yn to y to the n, we are shifting to the right by three units. And now once we work out the y to the n, we need to shift it to the left by three units to get the yn. Is that how you got the one, two, and three, one, two, three, four above? Oh, this is just an example that I, I created. Okay. I just generate this example. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, it's getting to that point that I keep getting stuck on how to, it's like the matrix multiplication is fine, but yeah. Yeah, I think in the exam we I think we we do not have this we we have this in the standard form so it should, uh, shouldn't be too worried about that but in the homework you need to deal with this time shift so for the uh, for the last uh, you mentioned the review the last problem for homework three we can do that uh, but uh, because we only have 10 minutes, what I suggest that we can do that in the office hour, because we don't have we don't have a problem that is as difficult as this one in the midterm one. So maybe we can first go to the homework four and see if we have any common questions on the homework, homework four. Okay. Okay. So I believe these are um, just all about convolutions, calculations on convolutions. Um, do you have any? Do you have? Do you guys have any questions? I don't know what is this one about. Any questions over the over the Zoom? Yeah, like the, for the first one, we have this uh, <coughs> convolution between X and V. Um, but and you, and you, when you write the convolution, um, you can choose. Remember, you can choose to fix one of them. So here, because V takes a segmented form, so maybe it is more convenient to fix to fix this one. Right. Let's try it. Let me try to fix X. Because integration X tau V T minus tau. But it's a little bit complicated for if we if we fix if we fix x and then shift v because v is constrained between zero and two. Therefore, if you write it in this way, you need to kind of constrain t minus tau into the range of you know zero to two. But just here the vt, we are restricting the entire. Uh, is time index t between zero and two. So which means 
this has to be restricted in zero and two. So maybe it is uh, more convenient to do it in the other way, where we just do v tau x v minus tau. Right, this is the definition of convolution, the basic definition. And then we can start it to uh, plug in the V tau. So V tau, V tau is two minus tau when tau is restricted between zero and two. So I'm gonna replace this by two minus tau. But remember V tau is, is restricted between zero and two. So at the same time, we can restrict this integration between zero and two. But I'm, I'm here, I'm just plugging in V tau into this convolution formula. Now V tau between, when tau is between zero and two, V tau takes this form. Otherwise V tau is zero. So that contributes nothing to the convolution. So, and then this becomes you know, much more simpler. And then I just need to substitute the X part. So it's two UT minus two UT minus two. So it's two So it's this one. And then you just work out the, <coughs> work out this integration. So you need to identify uh, this part. You need to identify this part and let's see, we can draw a picture. This u t minus tau. Now this is from u tau. We do a time reversal and shift it to right by t. So here I'm going to skip the intermediate steps. This is u t minus tau, and this is when the t is positive. Right? I, I think we don't have that issue here. But let's look at this one. This is u t minus two minus tau. So here I can treat comparing with this one, this basically T is replaced by T minus two. Everything else is the same. So this, this should be, so T minus two is on the left of T, right? So this is T, this is T minus two. And so this is U T minus two. Minus tau. And when you subtract, so we are subtracting the second one from the first one. And you can see that that will generate a window function because the everything small on the to the left of t minus two will be canceled out. These two they have the, the same amplitude. So and everything on the right of t will also cancel out. Both of them are zero. The only thing left is between between t minus two and t. Within this one, we have one minus zero, which is one. So this gives us a window function between t minus two and t. Okay. Therefore, Right, and then it's a it, it, it's a little bit more complicated because now you have let's write it down. You have zero to two, two minus tau, two times so whatever inside this bracket, we just show that it is a window function between t minus two and t. Uh, which is which is to restrict the integration between t minus two and t, but then 
the integration is now currently restricted between zero and two. So we need to discuss these two intervals. Okay, so let me write it. It is the in integration between zero and two intersect with t minus two and t two times t minus ten. It's not really at the bottom. And then you need to discuss the this intersection because I'm I'm just I'm going to highlight the idea here. So zero to two is a fixed interval on the uh, time time axis, and t minus two and t this interval is location really depends on the the value of t. So you you need to figure out. Depending on the value of t, right, this interval could be non-overlapping with zero to two. For example, if t is less than zero, or if t minus two is greater than two, right? So if I don't have more space, somehow I will say it here: if t less than zero, which means the right endpoint is less is on to the left. Of zero, or t e minus two, or the left endpoint is to the right of two. In both cases, these two interval has no overlap, and because they have no overlap, this integration is zero. Right? So we get zero. Otherwise, otherwise, if t if this right endpoint is between zero and two, there are three cases. If t is between zero and two, uh, then you can you can intuitively see that the the intersection is zero to t. So you have you have integration zero to t. And moreover, if t minus two is between zero and two, so you, basically you have these two cases. If this t is between zero and two, the intersection is between you know, this part is between zero to t. Uh, if t minus two is between zero and two, the intersection is you know, between t minus two to two. So the integration is between t minus two to two. Okay, so, and then once you figure out these separate cases, the integration is actually very simple. Okay. So the discussion here is um, a little bit complicated. And this is, And this is intuitive because if you visualize these two signals, right, X is a window signal. V is a, a, a line segment between zero and two. So when you take convolution between these two, uh, the resulting function is gonna have a it's piecewise. It really de depends on the range of the, the T. So the convolution result is actually not, not trivial. You, you need to express it in, into three segments. Okay, so in general, doing convolution uh, in a time domain is, may not be that easy, especially when the signal is restricted in a window. You, you always have at least three segments. Okay. Okay, so I, I guess I will stop here. So if you have questions regarding the rest of the homeworks, we can discuss them in the uh, office hours. But in the exam, the convolution will be will not 
be as complex as this one. Okay.